So of the 10 trends that I'm going to run through, um, the first one is a pretty big one, and that's what we've known as the internet as just chapter one. Little tiny, very low-cost sensors are being embedded into everything. It's going to be the chair you're sitting on. It's going to be the clothes you're wearing. And that's going to change things. And I'm talking about companies like Nest that makes this learning thermostat. This is the company set up by Tony Fidel, who created the iPhone and before that the iPod at Apple. He sold this to Google for $3.2 billion a few weeks ago. Um, the idea of the Nest is you're in the home. It works out. It's got sensors what your preferences are, who in the family is walking through, and it learns. And they're just starting. It's going to be, you know, they're doing a smoke alarm. Every appliance in your house is going to become smarter. I was talking to um, a couple of East European entrepreneurs that have created this product. It's called Teddy the Guardian. It's a, it's a furry teddy bear that you give to your child. Why? Because it's got lots of sensors in the arms. It can tell how stressed your child is, their temperature, all sorts of other things, and you subscribe to a service. If you can get that, if you're an anxious parent at work, want to know what's going on, you check on your phone. New business model, new technology empowering this. So this is Lockatron. In the sensor world, where everything is connected to the internet, you get really smart ways of rethinking stuff we take for granted. This is Lockatron, a lock that you can control from anywhere in the world through your smartphone. Not a bad idea if you're let, letting your place out to a stranger. Um, not every Internet of Things idea is going to change the world. This is called the Milkmaid. It's a jar with sensors that will tell you, send a message to your iPhone when the milk is starting to go sour. We've all been waiting for this. <laughs> but if you think about sensors embedded, connected to the network, why did a project um, about what it's going to be like in everyday life? So, you know, you're driving along the street, the taxi will get automatic directions based on your online schedule. The sandwich shop will know that you're coming near, so it will start your order. Or probably more important on the very right, the smartphone will warn you if there's an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend walking towards you so you can cross the street. But you know, this is just the beginning. So you play with apps. Maybe you even add things to your phone. But we're now about to get phones that can detect smell. Kind of blows my mind. So this is going to affect all sorts of businesses, often in ways we can't predict. So the second of the big trends, obviously, we're all very excited about these things. We probably walk along, walk into lampposts because we're checking our messages. Um, I think we have to see these not just for communication, but as a kind of remote control to increasingly everything. So there was a study done by a Finnish telco analyst called Tommy Ahonen on how much we're engaging with our phones. He reckoned 150 times a day, at least, we interrupt to look at the phone. Everything from the alarm that wakes you up in the morning to checking the SMS to using the camera. And that's 150 times a day that we're not engaging with you know, my magazine, with your business, with our children. And it's been a most fundamental shift. And we're not there yet. So, there's like 5 billion mobile phone users, mostly not yet on smartphones, maybe a, a billion and a half, heading towards 2 billion this year. And that's going to even out this year. And these are people who have probably not been on the internet yet. These are your customers. These are people who could work for you at low cost. And their expectations are going to be fundamentally different from what they have been. And then a new device comes out, a tablet, an iPad. And again, that transforms in real time how quickly you have to re-engage your team to say, actually, our customer behavior is changing. This is the orange line at the end, is quarter by quarter, the um, number of shipments of tablets. And look how quickly it overtook the blue, which is the notebook PC, and the green, which is the desktop PC. The desktop PC is increasingly not where the money is. If you think about it, the number of new smartphone users, you can't avoid this opportunity. You have to offer your service mobile first, not web first. So one of the other things that's happening big this year is a lot of companies are investing heavily in wearable computing. Now, wearable computing is probably not going to look like this. It probably won't look like this. I'm not sure it's going to look like this either, because would you feel comfortable would you feel your status was enhanced wearing something like Google Glass? 
I don't know. The technology is really smart. It responds to your commands. It will take a picture. It will show a video ahead of you that somebody sent you. But does it feel intuitive? It's got to be part of the way we live. It's got to be intuitive. There's companies now, this is called OmSignal, starting to put embedded technology, sensors in your clothes. It tells you, you know, your heart rate, how many steps you've done, even emotional, your mood. There's companies like Recon putting technology into the screen if you're skiing so you can see how fast you're going, what the weather's like, where your friends are. It gets very exciting, new opportunities. It simplifies skiing. You wear a wristband, a magic band, if you go to one of the Disneylands. Again, it's been pre-programmed. It gives you access to things if you've got extra privileges of not queuing so much. Again, I think what we want is something that is seamless, that interacts with the world in a way that is friction-free and not clunky. So you remember when everybody thought, if I learned software, I could create a blog, I could create a web page. It becomes democratized. Well, the same democratization process is happening to making physical hardware. And it's helped by services like Kickstarter. So a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter you can go to with any project. If the crowd likes it, they'll back it. The biggest success so far has been the Pebble Watch. They wanted to raise $100,000 to make a smartwatch that talked to the smartphone. They raised 10.3 million. We have some volume. This is Eric, who's behind Pebble. And this is my Pebble. Pebble is a watch that you can customize. It runs a lot of cool and useful apps and connects wirelessly by Bluetooth to your iPhone or Android smartphone. This is our dream team. That's their dream team. It's These are the people prototype. taking on Panasonic, taking on Sony, taking on Apple. Anybody can be that dream team now. And it changes the rules. And then new technologies come along. This was a few weeks ago. A bunch of Israeli researchers came up with a new algorithm that allows you to take a two-dimensional picture and work out where it curves. And so you can create a template to actually manufacture a 3D version. So they take a tap, a photo of a tap, and they can work out how to create a real tap that you can rotate. And this kind of blew my mind, because I think now any 2D picture can be turned into a real object. You can just distort a picture, and you can move things around. It's kind of, OK, this is where the world is going. Drones, anybody can make, the authorities can't control. What happens? There's a kind of dark side. So you get videos like this one online telling you how to shoot from your drone. So he doesn't actually show you a gun, he shows you paintball pellets. See a bit of it. We're using this, a realistic handgun paintball marker that only shoots these, 11 millimeter non-lethal paintball. Don't try this at home, okay? Can a mail-order drone from a kit even handle the stress of round cycling through a gun? Is it accurate? Let's find out. Do you remember the old days when the Civil Aviation Authority controlled what was in the air? That's all gone. There was, because drones are getting so cheap, there was a startup um, getting much coverage last year in San Francisco that would deliver your taco with a drone. Um, People were disappointed when it turned out to be a hoax, but then what happened was even more interesting. People were, actually, that's not a bad idea. And people started pitching businesses that would deliver your fast food, your pizza, through a drone. Yeah. Makes sense. Automation is getting really interesting. So robotics and artificial intelligence combining. And I'm just going to whirl through some of the examples I'm seeing now. So Boston Dynamics a company that Google bought recently, works mostly for the US military, makes a humanoid robot. Go to YouTube, look up Boston Dynamics, you'll have an hour of fun. Some Swiss scientists in Zurich have created drones that they've controlled, they can do some juggling. Couldn't have done this three years ago, two years ago. So you heard of self-driving cars, this is what Google's car sees when it gets to a junction. What about self-driving planes? So we did a story at Wired about the new era of self-driving planes controlled from the ground. 
So we're going to see these kind of increasingly low-cost robots in all sorts of fields. So we know about in factories making food. Not good for certain types of jobs, by the way. You may need to be nimble and be able to be retrained. Power has moved outwards from the organization to the individual. So behind this door in New York is Kickstarter. A bit of a mess, this door, in Lower East Side, in Rivington Street. But the revolution that companies like Kickstarter have created are just amazing. You're getting companies now going open source to make things like cars. This is OS Vehicle. They're building this car in less than an hour. Peer to peer, you can go and get your car. OK, you may not you know, want to take it out on a Saturday night, but it's the start of something. And if the community can take on the motor industry, what can't they do? If the community can take on the banking and the investment industry, what can't they do? This is AngelList, where angel investors meet. And individual angel investors with a good track record are creating syndicates, and other people can join their syndicate. And they are doing what venture capitalists used to do, and still are doing. But why would you pay the extra fees to the venture capitalists? TV. What do you do if you're a TV company now? The talent, the engagement, is going to places like YouTube. This is Michelle Fan. She sits in her bedroom talking about makeup. Two thirds of a billion people have seen it. She launched a $10 a month makeup delivery service. 36,000 people signed up within a day. Makeup companies are having to go to her directly. Trend seven. Can't think of e commerce. It's not a separate thing from commerce. People are selling all sorts of stuff online and offline, and it's all coming together. You can create your own shop now in a couple of minutes through a service called Shopify. Another one is called Ticktail. I was in Japan talking to Rakuten. They're creating an online shopping mall for pretty much anybody. One of the big success stories on Rakuten's online mall is a farmer who sells eggs through the post, and he puts videos of the chickens and how happy they are, and he blogs about it. So the online-offline mix has gone. Tesco, which bought Blinkbox, when you buy a DVD, they let you stream it at the same time, because it makes sense. If you're a retail brand, Kate Spade in New York, maybe take up some empty shop fronts and create a clickable window. Take a picture of something, order it. eBay will deliver it within an hour to where you are. If you're an online store, Warby Parker, very successful glasses online retailer, why not take physical space? Because it's about how people discover you. It's not about, oh, we're an online retailer. We're only going to take the money online. E-commerce, if we're allowed to use that word, is nowhere near where it's going to be. You know, it's going 10% of the commerce market within a couple of years. Interesting things that Burberry and other people are doing, trying to integrate their online, offline experience. So when you're in a store, it's familiar as the online store is. You get you know, Apple with phenomenal <coughs> results, rethinking what the store is. It's about service. It's about helping people rather than aggressively selling. And you know, they're doing all right. If you can get rid of the barriers, people will spend more money. You know, if you are a retailer, don't put a block when people are coming to buy saying, will you sign in? You know, do that afterward. That's convenient for you. Let people just go, experiment, do A-B testing, and follow the numbers, follow the data. And the data is there. There's you know, interesting things happening with retailers using mannequins. This is an Italian company, Almax, to tell you who that person is. This is a young female Caucasian. Tracking people inside stores, this is happening with face recognition. Maybe some privacy concerns, but these companies, Quividi says it keeps the data secure and it's non-identifiable. But you can see patterns, and it's all about measuring. You know, if you've got a website, is this the optimal way to get people to spend money? Do some A-B testing. Is add to wish list better than add to basket, because that's bigger? Try it out, see what happens. Make it easy for people to tell their social networks what they've just bought. There's a company called Jack Threads. Share this sale and get $10. Quite smart. So data analytics, I'm just going to whiz through, because I think this is one of the big tools that all of us should have. Even if you don't think you're into data, it's there for you. If um, you play games, you are being A-B tested. You're not playing the same game as other people because they're working out how to optimize your journey. Change the color of the background, change the speed that the characters move at, and they measure 
and they change things. Netflix measures what makes people engage more. When you join, they worked out that if they encourage you to save the names of films that you want to see one day, you will be more likely to stay as a loyal customer. So you can play with all sorts of ways to use data. So two more things. First of all, you've got to think about business models in a new way. Um, in the old days, you put something out there, people bought it. In the new days, often you're giving things away, and you get the super fans who end up paying. There's a book called The Curve by Nicholas Lovell, and he gives away an e-book, and he charges for the book, and going right up to the top, he charges like thousands of pounds for a masterclass. Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails you know, gives away some of his music, gave a very expensive, or uh, created a very expensive CD pack. It sold out within hours, like $100. You just have to experiment if there are people who love your product, don't necessarily set a limit to what you're doing. People are paying for access to things rather than owning things. And also, the idea of a community. GoPro, why would a commodity camera be worth three or 400 pounds? Because people who have it join a community where they share crazy videos like skiing in an avalanche. It's a huge success, GoPro, because they're not selling it as a camera, they're selling it as an idea. Um, if you're an insurance company, this is Oscar in New York, maybe don't see yourself as an insurer. People hate their insurers. Change it. See yourself as people's partner in health. Create free 24-hour hotlines. You're a health services partner now. Everybody loves that. Um, it's about having a better story. Spotify went to the music industry, and they had a better story. We'll make everybody have access to the music they want where they are, and they'll pay for the convenience. We used to think the money was there, but it's now in all these, including a consulting business and conferences. Vogue is now a restaurant in Moscow. GQ is now a bar in Istanbul. Although, you have to be careful, Cosmo became a yogurt a while ago, and that didn't really help anybody. You have to be exponential. So, at Singularity University, where I spent a week, um, they talk about the old linear world, one plus one, you get to 30 at the 30th step. But in an exponential world, where everything's doubling because of Moore's law, you get to a billion, and we're in that world. We're in that Moore's law curve, and that's affecting everything. The falling cost of solar energy, the falling cost of decoding DNA, falling cost of storage. So don't start from where we are today. Start from, if everything is doubling, if this is a fraction of as powerful as it's going to be in three years, if the ability of a new device to become mainstream is getting faster and faster, if companies can be exponential, look how much money Apple's making per employee. Look how many users, active users, WhatsApp have per employee. These are threats, maybe, but also opportunities. So last trend, you've got to disrupt before you're disrupted, just like this man, Stephen Sasson at Kodak, invented this lovely digital camera. But Kodak didn't make digital, they sold films, so they kind of buried it. Kodak went into bankruptcy last year at a time when this company with 13 employees was bought by Facebook for a billion, because this is where the world is going. New device like this comes out, Nokia dismisses it as a niche product because it wasn't how they were thinking. Remember Nokia, anybody? You can't predict how people are going to use a new technology. This is the rebels in Syria. Um, but you can think about which kind of products will engage them. It's not about price. The Nano failed in India, like the thousand-pound car, because it wasn't status-enhancing. People didn't want to buy it. The pirated movies are the ones that generally aren't available on the paid-for services. People will pay for these sorts of things. Um, TED took a risk by opening out, allowing TEDx of amateurs, non-professionals, to take their brand and run with it. Look how much help it gave TED. So I will end with a kind of, have that healthy disregard for the impossible. Be bold. Companies coming out of Singularity University are worth looking at creating a physical internet with drones. This is Matternet. Another one's trying to make synthetic meat. This is Modern Meadow. Peter Thiel put in a chunk of money. Maybe you will have a synthetic steak next time you're at the Grosvenor House. Um, I'm going to give you one last scenario. So 
It's 1983. This new gadget comes on the market. Celebrity endorsers. Your AT&T, the big American phone company, you think, do we need to start getting into these mobile telephones? You call in McKinsey, you pay them a chunk of money, and you say, by the end of the 20th century, like 17 years from now, how big will this mobile telephone thing be? And McKinsey goes and does the numbers. He says, well, we think in 2000, there'll be 900,000 of these in America. Which wasn't a bad guess. It's a little bit out. So I'm going to leave you with the, the mistake that McKinsey made was threefold. First of all, number one, it started from today's expectations. It didn't think how the technology would progress. These things would get smaller, Moore's Law and all that. Number two, it didn't take into account the emotional side of these phones, why we would want them, because they simplify our lives, they connect us to our loved ones. And number three, you can't really see that far into the future um, if you're not living it. You kind of need to be playing with these things, and you'll get that aha moment.